My name is Miki. I'm a Ghanaian immigrant living in the UK. I recently made a video explaining how my young family relocated to Ghana permanently, leaving me alone in the UK. Since that sudden turn of events in my life, it made the idea of moving back to Ghana not just one of the options, but the only option. So in this video, I ask an intelligent and industrious young Ghanaian, born and raised in London but doing big things in Ghana, if there are any opportunities for Ghanaians living in the diaspora like myself to at least make a living out of. This conversation was very informative. I hope you enjoy. Hello Kojo, how are you doing? Hi Mickey, I'm doing well, thank you for asking yourself. Yeah, not bad. Thank you very much for doing this interview with me. I know who you are. Can you please tell our viewers who you are and your journey? Who am I? Mickey, I am a Ghanaian man born and raised in Europe who is now for the first time in his life living in Ghana, trying to discover exactly what you're asking me, who I am. But at the same time, I'm also exploring some business opportunities here. Okay, now that you've mentioned business opportunity, that was uh, the main thing about this video. Have you spotted business opportunities in Ghana? The actual answer is no. And the reason why is because I don't like to say I've spotted business opportunities. I've spotted problems that I can potentially solve and in the process create a business opportunity. And, and I think that's important to outline because I don't know what that means when people say, are there opportunities in Ghana? Opportunities to do what? I think in Ghana there are opportunities because there are, that there are problems with which people have opportunities to solve. But this is exactly true in Europe, in Asia and everywhere else. I, I suppose what you're really asking is, are the problems in Ghana that the everyday man can solve and create a business opportunity in the process? And I think here in Ghana, there are more lower level problems, which means people like myself can try and solve those problems and create business opportunities. I, I hope that makes sense. That, what that, I'm trying that to say. really makes sense. And you have actually opened my mind to different angle to this whole documentary that I'm making. OK. Oh, so that's good. So these problems that you found or you've seen, do you think an average born um, Ghanaian will be able to solve them and potentially turn it into a business opportunity. And again, this is one of those answers where I, I have to say yes and no at the same time. Can the average Ghanaian man or woman solve them? Absolutely. Will they identify them? Probably not. And can they afford to finance the process of creating the solution, definitely not. So the Ghana man, the, the Ghanaian woman, the common Ghana man, Ghanaian woman, and, and myself, we're exactly the same, yeah. right? Literally the same. The only difference is that I was born and raised in a different country. So in terms of having the intellectual ability, in terms of having the willpower, the discipline, the genetics to solve these problems, yes. I think the problem is one of identification. Now, what I mean by that is, because I have come from a different environment, I have seen different things. I'm not saying better, I'm not saying worse, just different, okay? And my differences of experiences shape my understanding of the world. And people here, the common man, the common woman in Ghana, they have experienced also a different lifestyle and that shapes their experiences. So when you bring that together, when you bring someone like me coming from a different environment into a place like Ghana, what that means is I have a mental collusion of ideas that are sometimes contradictory because there are things that are done different in Ghana than they are done in the UK. Yeah. I have moments where I'm confronted with a, a dissonance almost because you realize that certain things happen in Ghana in different ways than they happen in Europe, but things are still being accomplished. And when that happens for certain people, you have the ability to compare and contrast and figure out, well, what works better given what you know. And when you're in that sort of situation, then you're able to identify problems. So as an example, I can go to a restaurant here in Ghana and I can make an order for food 
and the staff will come back to me and say, I'm sorry, we, we, we gave you the wrong order. I thought I overheard something else. And, and that's not really a bigger problem than that. It happens every day. People hear the wrong things, they take the wrong order. But me, as somebody who comes from the Western market, I know what a POS is. I know what a payment uh, system is, right? I know that actually technology exists where the waitress or the waiter can take my order and put it in the system and then the system sends my order to the kitchen, right? And I haven't invented the, the, the POS system. I didn't know what that was until the first day I stepped into the restaurant and I saw a waiter or a waitress using it in Europe. But so my point being, in that moment there, when I'm sat in that Ghanaian restaurant with the waitress telling me, I'm sorry, I've messed up your order, I heard the wrong thing. And in that moment, oh my God, but what if I order wholesale 50 POS systems from China, import them into Ghana, and then negotiate with restaurant managers and showcase to them how much profitability you'll improve when your systems are in place because you're not making human errors. And I have that conversation with them and there you go. In that moment That's there, I've identified a problem moment, yeah. and I've created a business opportunity. Yeah. So that only becomes pal palpable and possible because I have seen those problems being solved in different markets and the common man in Ghana and the common woman in Ghana may not have been exposed to that education and that's really the only difference. That is, you know, at the beginning of my documentary, I did not even think about this identification bit and that is one thing that the diasporas will have that most, you know, most of the indigenous youth will not have. Apart from that, do you think finance is also a problem? Absolutely. It's, it's, and that's on every level. And, you know, that's not between the Ghanaian and the Dysporian. That's just between levels of life in the sense of I can see right now I'm looking at a piece of land. I'm, as in with my own eyes. I'm, I'm, you'll see it on video. And when I look at this land, I think about what I could build here. I think, oh, I could build a restaurant here perhaps, or I could build some housing that I'm going to rent out on Airbnb because I potentially have the means to play in that le level. But a, a common Ghanaian man might look at this land and think, hey, maybe I can use it as a junkyard or I can use it as a, as a garage uh, where people can just put their cars and park them because they realize they may not have the capital to invest in something like real estate or a restaurant. But you get to a point where you just see a field and all you do is see a field because you have no more means to even think about investing in what this field could be because all your money is spent feeding your family or paying for your direct needs, yeah. right? So the problem of finances isn't one between me and the diaspora, but it's just levels of life because someone else from the diaspora could see that land and think I could build an amusement park here, as an example. That's something I would never think about because I don't have amusement park money. So, th so that's what it is really. You need finances to invest, right? And if you don't have any at all, then you can't really solve any problems potentially. But, but that, and, and that's a part of the problem, yes. Yeah, but since you've been, have you started, I'm, I'm sure you started some ventures already, have you? Multiple, multiple. There are multiple problems that I'm trying to solve, that I am working on a plan to solve, and then I'm testing whether I believe that these problems actually exist because it's me that sees these problems, but that's me. I am not my market. I am not going to sell to myself. So that's where the market research comes into play. That's where you, you know, create a business plan, etc. But yes, right now I have identified problems which I'm trying to solve. Is there a way to go over these obstacles? Have you mastered a way? Certainly not mastered, <laughs> but I am actively working towards solving even the problems that I am facing when trying to solve the, 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 the one problem which I believe I can capitalize on. It's, and, you know, it's just really a series of problem solving. First you identify the problem, then you need to figure out whether that problem is a real problem, and then you have the problem of actually trying to solve that problem. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm using the word problems a lot, but that's really what it is. That's really just what it is. And eventually you get to a point where you sell the problem uh, as a good or a service. And that's when you can capitalize it 
when you sell that problem for more than it costs you to solve that problem financially and then you scale it and that's the business and that's the business opportunity so when i say are there business opportunities here in Ghana? I don't know. Yes, no, I'm not sure. But are there problems here to solve? Absolutely, without a shadow of a doubt. But do you need more than just the knowledge of identification? Yes, you do need finance. But even when you have finance, that isn't all you need. A lot of people come here with money trying to solve real problems, but go bankrupt. Then you need process, then you need uh, you know, the ability to stay adaptable, then you need perseverance, then you need strategy. There's so much more than you need for a problem to become a business opportunity that you solve. But yes, there are problems here for, for everyone to identify. With your ventures, with the problems that you're trying to solve, have you encountered some institutional problems that you think, oh, maybe in the UK this would have been straightforward? Mickey, on every level of operation, I have had that feeling that this is overly complicated here in Ghana. And it's because there's a lack of process here. There's a lack of standard operization of procedure over here. And there's just a lack of centralized knowledge and ex exchange of information. So it, it's, it's, it's tough. It's tough on every regard. That is it. You know what? Um... Thank you very much, but I want to ask you a final, final, final question, right? This is like by the by. Um, at your age, how did you manage to shape your way of thinking when it comes to finance-wise and when it comes to thinking, critical thinking? How did you manage to shape your thinking like that? So it, it was a subconscious effort before it became a conscious one. Because what you say you were doing at my age, I, I've also been doing and all those activities that are around that sort of behavior. Let's just call it wasting time, right? Or being unproductive with your time. And at some point, naturally, just naturally, I just got bored of what I was doing, i.e. wasting time and being unproductive. And, and thank God that that came to me naturally. And from then on, if I realized that if I'm not going to do what I've been doing, or what am I going to do with my time? And then as well, I'm a very observant person and I'm looking around and I'm looking at maybe the house that I'm living in compared to some of my friends. And I'm looking at maybe the food that I'm eating compared to that they're eating. And I'm wondering, well, okay, I guess that comes down to money, these very f specific material things. And then I started looking into and reading into, well, how do you have money? Oh, okay, it means you save more than you spend on any given day, in any given week, over a time that becomes years and by the end of it, you've got more than you've spent. And, and, and that's really the formula to it. And then, okay, well, how can you increase what you have so that you don't need to work on spending less? And then if you go down this train of thought, you land to the books like The Psychology of Money, and you land to principles such as stoicism as a way to maybe live life. And you, you get to these places because a lot of people have already gone through these journeys. What I'm doing and what I've done has been done before me and will be done after me. And, and all those people doing it are all independent of each other. So I suppose the last thing is you begin to realize that a smart man learns from his own mistakes, but maybe a genius learns from the mistakes of others. And there are so many other people that have documented this journey that you can learn from, and you can pretty much just replicate and adapt and, and innovate from then on out. And that's pretty much what I'm doing, pretty much what everyone else is doing, Mickey. Okay, so and this is the final question. When you said um, you, learn from, <laughs> you learn from other people's you know, documentation and that, for me, I learned from Rich Dad Poor Dad. Is there a book or a documentary or a video that you watch that was the awakening for you? So I, I did mention one book already just now, The Psychology of, of Money. That book is, 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 is insanely powerful. But, but for me, my biggest lessons in life have not been uh, direct teachings where Rich Dad Poor Dad as an example or any book is you're supposed to come out of that with knowledge but for me it's those and this is just the way my mind works but it's the lessons of, of life that life has just indirectly given me when I look at my mum and perhaps 
the lack of joy that she has sometimes conflicted upon herself, I've learned a lot of lessons from that. When I look at maybe the story of my uncle and situations that he's had perhaps with women, I've learned a lot of lessons from that. Some of my friends who went down certain lanes in life, maybe to make quick money and certain things didn't go the way they thought, I've learned a lot of lessons from that. And it goes on, I, it's, and it's just being an everyday student. When somebody talks, I listen, or I don't get involved in the conversation. So what I mean to say is when someone is speaking, I'm really always actively listening and looking for either lessons or what you might call business opportunities, but what I would call identifying problems that I may or may not in a later date turn into a business opportunity. And, and that's really it. Though it's not looking at it as a business opportunity, but a problem. Whether you can turn it into a business opportunity is up to you. Kojo, thank you very much. and. I feel like I can talk to you for the whole day um, and I cannot wait to come to Ghana to meet you. Is there anything else you want to say? No, man. I just want to give you a huge shout out because you're doing incredible things yourself. And it's for me sitting down watching someone like you live your life, I get envious, you know, in terms of the way that you've going across different countries, working in different markets, meeting different people from all over the world. That is what it is to be human, in my humble opinion. And it's incredible. And just keep it up, man. It's awesome. But Joe, you are also doing really well. Like, it's just your age that, that astonished me and how you've woken up so early in your life. And I think um, the only way is up for you. This is not going to be the only or the last um, conversation I'm having with you. The next time I have a conversation is going to be face to face and I can't wait. Thank you very much for doing this. Thank you very much, sir. Have a lovely day. Bye-bye. Bye. All right, you too. Bye.